The new economic numbers are out, and it now seems clear President Trump has helped create one of the greatest economies in American history. In the wake of the good news, Democrats are scrambling to find an effective way to campaign against him. In an interview given to Chuck Todd in the bowels of Castle Democrat, which sits on the mist-shrouded crags atop mountain competence, DNC Chairman Hapla Schmo said, quote, We thought if you journalists kept using the word bombshell over and over, we might be able to sell the people on this cockamamie nonsense about Ukraine or wherever it is. But if they're not stupid enough to fall for that, they're sure enough not going to vote for one of our lousy candidates, unquote. The lousy candidates, meanwhile, have been retooling their campaign slogans in hopes of offering voters an alternative to peace and prosperity. For instance, Joe Biden is testing out the new slogan, sure, America is doing great, but that doesn't mean we couldn't use a doddering corrupt old fool in the White House. Elizabeth Warren is now using the slogan, the economy is amazing, but I have a plan for that. And Pete Buttigieg has new signs that read, who wants a gorgeous, graceful, kind, stylish and elegant first lady when you could have my husband Christian instead? Bernie Sanders has been telling his rallies, quote, I happen to believe that every man, woman and child should have a free alley cat for dinner like they do in other socialist countries, unquote. And in his new TV ad, Cory Booker says, quote, I'm walking around bare chested in a short leather skirt because I'm Spartacus. No, really, unquote. Finally, Nancy Pelosi will be running to hold her speaker seat with the slogan, I prayed for the president and look how well he's doing. Clearly, God listens to me, so you should keep me in Congress. Democrats say if these slogans don't work, they'll just go back to shrieking lies while the media pretends to believe them. As usual, trigger warning. I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. I'm the hunky donkey. Life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing. Hunky donkey doo. Ship shaped, ipsy topsy. The world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day. Hooray, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! All right, hooray, hurrah! We are back. It is Monday to say that the new jobs numbers are terrific is really to undersell them. To get them right, you would have to invent some ridiculous cartoon word like super de fantastico miraculoso, but then you would sound like an idiot, as I probably just did. Maybe most important among the new numbers is the one telling us that a lot fewer people are working part-time out of necessity. Around 80% of part-time workers are now doing it for non-economic reasons. What this means, to put it bluntly, is that husbands are earning more so wives can do important stuff like create good people and homes. It also exposes the big lie that the Obama economy was a positive one. Obama's bogus low employment numbers masked families scrambling to survive on piecework. But though Obama was a terrible economic president, at least his foreign policy sucked beyond description. Low taxes, low regs, more freedom, more capitalism, plus business-friendly attitudes and pro-America cheerleading from orange man, not so bad after all, have done the trick. But while North America in general and the U.S. in particular are the most prosperous places in the world right now, not everything is tickety-boo. There's the national debt for one thing and the fact that no one wants to do anything about it. But even more important is the damage that's been done to our social fabric in the last 20 years of both Republican and Democrat governance. Americans are killing themselves in record numbers. According to a Senate report released in September, the combined mortality rate from suicides and alcohol-related deaths is higher than at any point in more than 100 years. Suicides have, been so, have not been so common since 1938, and one has to go back to the 1910s to find mortality from alcohol-related deaths as high as today's. The most dramatic rise in such deaths has been since 1999 among non-Hispanic whites. I don't know all the reasons for this, but studies show globalism has destroyed communities in the heartland, the government no longer has the trust of the governed, and religion is dropping off. And it seems logical to me that all of these have played a part in our epidemic of despair. And that means that our elites have failed us. Their ideas have failed us. Their crony capitalism has hobbled economic mobility. Congress has absconded from its responsibilities and sloughed them off on a cancerous deep state that now conspires against our duly elected president. And tenured intellectuals have preached a leftist materialism that not only doesn't work practically, but also flies in the face of our absolute certainty that religious faith and practice make people happier, more charitable, more forgiving, and less likely to enslave themselves to drugs and reckless sex. Our universities are toxic. 
Our news and entertainment media are dishonest and corrupt, and our government is filled with unconstitutional bad actors. This doesn't mean it's bad to have an elite. It means our elite has played itself out. That means the rest of us, both liberals and conservatives of all colors and any loving religion, have to seize this Trumpian moment of peace and prosperity, ignore the calls to hate one another, and work together to rebuild a culture of God, freedom, and patriotism. And from that will emerge a new, refreshed elite that really could, to coin a phrase, make America great again. All right, we're going to talk about this. We first have to talk about Another Kingdom, which is out now for everybody. The new episode is out. But if you subscribe, you can get it on Fridays to cut down on the Clavenless weekend. Now you can just kind of crawl out of your despair, the chaos that comes when I'm away, and get back to Another Kingdom. It's, this is going to run on, I, I think, through January. So uh, it's it's a long story, but it is, uh, it is now in, in its heart. And I think it's really these are some of the best episodes as far as I'm concerned. So I hope you will tune in. Um, so there's some other, there's a new impeachment hearing uh, in the House today. And I know you care just as deeply as I do. And here is CNN reporting on what's going on. Good afternoon. And with that gavel coming down, I'm Jake Tapper in Washington. And you're watching special coverage of this historic day. This is a historic day here in the nation's capital. It will be a busy and historic day ahead. You're watching CNN special live coverage of what can only be described as an historic day. This is turning out to be a historic day, a very important day. And another very, very important and historic day, a very historic and important day. Another historic day here in Washington, historic day here in the nation's Capital. Chris, this is going to be another historic day here in Washington. At the end of a long and certainly historic day. A truly historic day. It was a historic day on Capitol Hill. A historic day with millions watching. A historic day. Historic day on this historic day. We're just getting started on this important historic day. All right, it is a historic day on Capitol Hill. You are fake news. <laughs> CNN was so ticked off about that. They tried to pull it down, but we have it here. Uh, you know, their, their ratings now, CNN's ratings have now tanked so low. It's, it's embarrassing. I mean, the uh, let's see, what do we got? They've got uh, Fox News averaged 2.2 million viewers during the primetime hours of 9 to 11 from November 25 through December 1st. MSNBC averaged 1.3 million viewers. Uh, CNN managed 643,000 average viewers, which in... Statistical terms is none. Nobody is now watching CNN because they're lying all the time. They can't stop. And this is this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about an elite that is stuck in its own world. It's stuck in its own uh, kind of echo chamber, I guess they call it. But still, it's just the fact that they're echoing these ideas back and forth at one another. So nobody can say, oh, we suck. We stink. We're wrong. We've got bad ideas. We're lying to people. Just the fact that we think journalism is lying like that, is telling people it's an historic day when it is not an historic day. See, that's the difference between CNN and the world. On CNN, it's an historic day in the world, not an historic. Maybe I should repeat that just so you get historic on CNN, not historic in real life. And I think that that's the difference that people are starting to see and they don't want to hear it anymore. Perfect metaphor for our elites, a perfect metaphor for our elites in, I think it's in Miami. Yeah, the Art Basel, Miami Beach, um, art gallery. They put up a banana. You probably heard about this on the wall with duct tape across it. And there are three versions of this, but they're all a banana on the wall with duct tape on it, priced at $120,000 and sold for $120,000. This is a metaphor for our elite. Okay. A banana on the wall, duct tape to the wall. Somebody paid $120,000 for it. Some people are saying this is just money laundering, but there it is. 120 grand banana duct tape on wall. A performance artist, right? Comes in and eats it. <laughs> he eats the banana. <laughs> and to a guy named David Daytuna eats the $120,000 banana duct taped to the wall, takes it off the wall, eats it and says, I really love this installation. It's very delicious. And this is also for our elites. This is also a work of art. People are t- taking pictures of it and, you know, and saying, oh, this is also perfor- this is a performance. This is a performance. You know, OK, maybe it's not singing Rigoletto. Maybe it's not actually acting or doing something worthwhile, but it's a performance to eat the banana that someone paid one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for because someone else put it up on the wall and said it was a work of art. This, these are our elites. 
After this happens, somebody sneaks in and writes on the wall where the banana was, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. And the uh, museum comes in and covers it up. I mean, that is, to me, a metaphor. This is, this is the civilization, Western civilization, that created the Sistine Chapel, right? This is the <laughs> civilization that created Hamlet and King Lear. Now, art is a banana taped to the wall, and someone who's willing to pay six figures for this, someone else thinks it's art to eat the banana, which at least is a good joke, right? And then when they put up something that's actually true about our elites, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, they cover it up. <laughs> that, to me, is a perfect perfect. You know, it, it really it really is fascinating to me. To, uh, over the weekend on Twitter, uh, Matt Walsh and then I think Knowles joined in, a couple of people were joining in, we're having this argument about uh, controlling pornography. This is kind of a tangent, but I'll, I'll get back to the impeachment and stuff like this. Stuff, stuff is happening in the impeachment because they're about to release this uh, IG report on the Russia investigation, but that's going to happen. Real, it's probably happening Right now, well, it's going to happen in about 20 minutes, I think. So I won't be able to talk about that. I won't be able to read that. I'll get back to it in a minute. But let me go off on this tangent for a minute. Knowles and Walsh, they're arguing that pornography should be outlawed or censored or at least controlled, right? And a lot of people come on and start arguing with them. This is tyranny. This is a, a nightmare. Now, there's a legitimate debate to be had about the fact that pornography is immoral. It is, it's degrading. It's degrading to the people who do it. It's degrading to the people who look at it. How much rights do you have to destroy yourself, right? How, you know, and how much uh, can, the, can the government say, no, this is a degrading uh, thing that you're doing and we're going to turn it off. We're not going to let it happen or at least control it and keep it out of the hands of children where we know it's destructive. Perfectly fair debate to say, should we give that power to a government that we know wants to censor real speech? They want to call hate speech anything that they disagree with. They want to uh, censor people from uh, putting out ads. They hate Citizens United, which allowed someone to put out an anti-Hillary um, documentary while she was running for while she was running for office. They they believe that's a horrible thing that the Supreme Court did, allowing people to put out anti-Hillary documentaries while she was running for office. And of course, that's Classic free speech has, should have the classic protection. So should we trust a government to censor porn? Fine. All good debates. What really fascinated me were the number of people who came on Twitter and said morality is relative, who said you can't legislate morality because morality is relative. One man's morality is another man's immorality. And what fascinates me about that is that's ill-informed. That's, it's, not, it's not just wrong. It's, it also happens to be wrong, but it's also badly educated. Someone told them that. They, don't, they haven't researched it themselves. They haven't studied it. Nobody said, here's the information. Let's make up our mind. Let's have a, a symposium, a debate. No one said that to them. They just told them that, our elites. That comes, that's, that's what I talk about when I talk about uh, ideas trickling down from the top. If somebody says to you, morality is relative. They heard that somewhere. They didn't do the research because in fact, when you do the research, when you find out about the morality of different cultures, morality is not really relative. The morality of different cultures does not change that much. What changes is their, their uh, understanding of the fact. So for instance, uh, people once burned witches because they believed there were witches and witches had real power and real evil power. So they burned them. But now we know that's not true, so we don't worry about it anymore. But this, we still believe that evil is evil, right? So even the person saying to Walsh, uh, morality is relative, is doing that on an understanding of shared morality. The shared morality is the tyranny is wrong. The person saying that is saying morality is relative and therefore to censor pornography would be tyranny. And tyranny is wrong. And you understand it's wrong. And I understand it's wrong because we share a common morality because there are certain rules to morality that virtually everybody shares. There are some people, uh, small tribes here and there that maybe don't share them, but there are small tribes here and there that can't count and can't spell. So there are people who don't know the, the common morality, but there is a common morality uh, that, again, differences. There are shades of difference. There are shades of understanding. There are shades of constant differences on how it should be applied. And of course, there are places where good aims conflict. So uh, you might say it's more important to censor pornography because it's evil. And somebody else might say, well, it's more important to keep the government from having that power. But you're both arguing over a shared morality. You both know you're dealing with good aims that conflict. So that is that is why I talk about our elites having failed us, because somebody can say morality is relative. And they've been preaching this since the 40s and 50s. And and that and then that trickles down to somebody who doesn't think, well, is it 
Is it rel- would I even be saying it was relative if I weren't making a moral argument that Walsh is going to understand and that I both understand? Let me give you one more metaphor for our elites. Yesterday there was that I think at the Kennedy Center uh, where they have the uh, they give you know art awards and Donald Trump didn't go because he didn't want the artists dissing him, but Nancy Pelosi did go and she got a standing ovation. Nancy Pelosi was running this impeachment thing, got a standing ovation. Now, Nancy Pelosi made an utter fool of herself last week as she got caught in this, you know, her daughter once said that Nancy Pelosi would cut your head off and you wouldn't even know you were bleeding. But to me, she looks like somebody who's been cut off at the knees and is kind of stumping around in this mess she's gotten herself into. And she came out and made the um, made the announcement that she was going to they were going to have impeachment draw up articles of impeachment. The vote on this may be as early as this week, which is insane when you think about it. And James Rosen said, are you doing this because you hate Trump? And Pelosi just went off on him. Uh, This is cut eight. This is about the Constitution of the United States and the facts that lead to the president's violation of his oath of office. And as a Catholic, I resent your using the word hate in a sentence that addresses me. I don't hate anyone. I was raised in a way that is full, a heart full of love and always prayed for the president. And I still pray for the president. I pray for the president all the time. So don't mess with me when it comes to words like that. So cut your head off and you won't even know you're bleeding. (laughs) So so this is to me, I look at this and I see a woman in a panic. I see somebody who think, who's in this stuck in this thing. She doesn't know. She knows how she got here, but she doesn't know how she's going to get out of it. She knows it's bad, Seth. She knows it's bad, uh, bad voodoo, but she's got to go through with it, and she's stuck. So the left immediately says, oh, don't mess with, hashtag, don't mess with Nancy. Here is David Brooks, who is basically the avatar of the elite. Here is a guy who thinks that conservatism is how well you're dressed and how well your uh, sh- shoes are pressed, how well your pants are pressed, and a guy who is writing about morality while he's dumping his wife, at, you know, and he's writing about morality with the girl he ran ran away with. And here's what he says about this. I should say I thought Nancy Pelosi had one of the best political moments of the year this week in saying that she doesn't hate Donald Trump. She's going to pray for Donald Trump. Um, That was, I I just thought, a beautiful moment of, of, well, she said said it's her Catholic faith of Christian witness. Christian witness. That's what it was. This is a woman who believes in abortion uh, up until I think you're five years old or something like this. And she t- she once said basically that the cat that Catholic thought is in line with her about this. So she actually, you know, Rush Rush Limbaugh says she only cites her Catholic uh, her, she, she cites her Catholic faith until she's talking about abortion or something like this. And Rush, of course, is almost never wrong, but he's wrong about this because she even cited her Catholic faith in support of abortion. So she's even worse than this. I mean, this kind of to have a politician come out and drag her religion into a defense of this thing, which means nothing. Uh, obviously, she despises the president. Obviously, she has said all this terrible stuff about it. And then to have her backed up by this New York Times writer, this elite New York Times writer. This is the kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I can only think of filthy phrases for it. I don't want to use, you know, uh, but it, this is the kind of circular uh, firing squad that the our elites have gotten themselves into, that they're believing their own lies. And what's really interesting is on CNN, where no one was watching, so I bring it to you because I know that nobody else is watching, John King starts to understand, you know, he actually put out a little montage of what Nancy Pelosi really sounds like to the rest of us. So it's filtering in a little bit that things may not be going so well. And here's John King talking about the real Nancy Pelosi, as I think most of the rest of us are seeing her. The president is a very effective communicator, whether you like him or not, whether you support him or not. The president is a very effective communicator using Twitter and other platforms to get his side out. Uh, The House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, has decided, because she is the leader of the House Democrats, and these are her decisions, that she is now a front person for this as it goes forward. And to your point about what will will the article say? What specifically will you charge against the president of the United States? Uh, Jake Tapper tried to get some answers last night. No, this isn't about politics at all. I don't think that the the 2020 election is going to ride on this. We're operating uh, collectively. It's not going to be um, somebody put something on the table. We have our own, uh, shall we say, um, communication with each other. Okay. So I'm not going to answer one, with all due respect, I'm not going to answer one charge. We're not writing the, uh, the articles of impeachment here tonight. You can see her struggling there. (laughs) 
<laughs> I would say so, John. You can see, you just, if you look really, really closely, you can see her struggling. It, it is a, an amazing thing when you watch it on TV and then you look at it in the, on the screen of your own rational mind and you see this woman saying, she'll say anything. You know, she said, she made a speech, she said the, the, she was on CNN Town Hall and she said, uh, oh, the future of the civilized world is at stake. She said, this has absolutely nothing to do with politics. You heard her. I mean, this is a woman who's struggling with the fact that she is stuck in this kind of madness that her her group has gotten into that she can't get them out of because because the press is echoing it back to them and because they think this is what the youth are going to believe tomorrow. But remember, pe- young people grow up, they listen to their college professors, and then they grow up and they find that reality is not what their professors told them it is. And, you know, just to, just to go on a little bit about this, that Joe Biden had this moment uh, with a voter when the voters started to ask him about the corruption of his son. Uh, let's play this. I've been around a long time, and I know more than most people know. And I can get things done. That's why I'm running. And you want to check my shape on, let's do push-ups together, man. Let's, do, let's run. Let's do whatever you want to do. Let's do my number, two. number two. Number two. No one has said my son has done anything wrong, and I did not on any occasion. And no one has ever said it. Not I didn't once. say you were doing anything wrong. I you said, said I set up my son to work in an oil company. Isn't that what you said? I Get your work straight, Jack. That's what I we hear on the on MSNBC. You don't hear that in MSNBC. No, no, you did not hear that. No, but you heard. No, Look, you okay, I'm not going to get an argument with you, man. No, no, I don't want to. Well, yeah, you do. But uh, <laughs> but look, Pat. Look, here's the deal. Here's the deal. It, it, looks, it looks like you, you don't have any more back bone than Trump does. If we were in high school, I'd take him behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> you know, this is the thing about this is this is a, a man of power. This guy's been vice president of the United States. This is a man of power talking to a voter. OK, so people are saying, oh, he was tough. Oh, he would. Yeah, yeah. Come on. I mean, the guy, he called him fat. We heard that. He said, oh, I'm going to beat you with push ups and all this. <laughs> this is a party that is in the sewer. This is a party that is swirling down the drain. I, I, you know, and when they talk, I mean, you can even hear, hear Je- put, put Jerry Nadler on. I mean, this is why they asked him why you're hurrying with the, uh, with the impeachment. Listen to what he said. If he's acquitted, do you believe we'll have a fair election in 2020? I don't know. The president, uh, based on his past performance, will do everything he can to make it not a fair election. And that is part of what gives us the urgency uh, to proceed with this impeachment. Chuck Todd, top Democrat Chuck Todd, interviewing top Democrat Jerry Nadler. <laughs> and, and he's saying, you know, that, oh, yeah, because he, he remember the Russian collusion. He did that. So now what, what he'll probably do it again. But of course, that's been disproved. So they're just living in this in their own kind of, you know, uh, bubbling formula of lies and distortion. And they think we're falling for it. But the ratings at CNN, where they're supposed to be reporting the news, have dropped and dropped and dropped because People know this is not the truth. People on both sides. And look, you know, there, I think that there's always a debate to be had between liberals, true liberals, not leftists, but liberals and conservatives. There's always g- debates whether we're moving forward, what we can leave behind, what we need to conserve. Those are always good debates in every civilization, in every free society. That's great. But we're not talking about that. We are talking about an elite idea of leftist materialism that has failed, but that they're stuck on. They're mired into it up to their butts and they can't get out of it. And meanwhile, Donald Trump, simply by using tried and true, uh, you know, capitalist free market ideas like lower taxes, lower regs, uh, animal spirits in the economy has. What did he create? It was like two hundred and sixty six thousand jobs added last month, the fastest pace since January. The jobless rate is back to three point five percent. 3.5%, the lowest level since 1969. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. (laughs) Wages are up. I I never know whether these are voices in my head or everybody can hear these, but wages are up 3.1% from a year earlier. I think we got to play the Trump happiness montage. I think we just have to do it. We're going to win so much. We're going to win at every level. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
win economically. We're going to win with the economy. We're going to win with military. We're going to win with health care and for our veterans. We're going to win with every single facet. My, oh, my, what a wonderful day. We're going to win so much, you may even get tired of winning. Yeah! <laughs> All right, we cut that a little short, but still, you know, you know what? You know what Islamist terrorism and cancer have in common? If you don't talk about them, they disappear. If you don't pay any attention to them, they go away. If you have cancer and you just don't pay any attention to it, it'll, it'll just gets instantly better. Same thing with Islamist terrorism. And I mentioned this on the same topic of elites and lies, okay? Elites and this make-believe world they think is a better world because they don't trust us to know the truth and make decisions. That's why. I mean, that's why they think they can lie out of... You know, there was a a terrorist attack. Well, we don't know yet whether it was a terrorist attack, but there was a Saudi uh, national in uh, on Friday, I believe it was, who was being trained at a flight school, which obviously brings back these kind of horrible memories of (laughs) 9-11. And he opened fire on his class and he killed three young Navy guys. Uh, three young Navy people who shot, shot dead. And they're now looking at this as if it were terrorism. Here is the National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien. I, I don't see anything that, there, that there's a broader pot. I, I'm watching the same things that you're watching and, uh, and, and the public reports. And uh, th- this is a guy who, who may very well have, uh, have said some things on Twitter that suggest he was radicalized. Uh, he went out and, and killed a number of, uh, of Americans. Uh, so I, my point is, it looks like terrorism. We'll have to see what the FBI investigation shows, what his motivations were. The Saudis have promised full cooperation uh, with the investigation. We're going to take them at their word. And, and the FBI is, is very competent in doing these things. They'll get to the bottom of it, and we'll have a full report. But I'm, my point is, it looks, from what we're seeing in, in the public reports, that uh, this looks like something that's terrorism or akin to terrorism. So, so the New York Times, a former newspaper, runs the headline, Saudi suspect clashed with instructor, right? The FBI says it leads with the FBI said it was conducting a terrorism investigation into the shooting. But then they go into the story about how he got really angry because his instructor, his flight instructor called him porn stash in front of about 10 other aviation students. And this he found uh, humiliated and angry and suggesting that this is the reason he went off. Now, they're investigating also that he went to Saudi Arabia where he may have been radicalized. But the Times thinks that they can cover this up. And if they can uh, uh, create enough smoke and mirrors and make it sound like it was about some personal clash, had nothing to do with Islam, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's, just, you know, uh, the Fox and Friends host, Pete uh, Hegseth, uh, posted the, the guy had these anti-Israel, anti-American um, social media uh, posts. Uh, he posted, this is the killer. He posted, I'm against evil and America as a whole has turned into a nation of evil. I'm not against you for just being American. I don't hate you because of your freedoms. I hate you because every day you are supporting, funding and committing crimes, not only against Muslims, but also against humanity. So Pete put this up on Twitter and was banned from Twitter. It was taken down. It was barred from Twitter. Why? Because if you ignore Islamic terrorism, if you don't talk about it, it's just like cancer. It goes away. It's amazing. It's an amazing treatment. This is a new treatment. They used to operate. They used to, you know, on cancer, they used to operate. They used to give you, you know, uh, uh, chemicals and radiation and stuff. But now they realize that if you just ban people from talking about cancer on Twitter, it goes away. Okay. And this is, this is our elites. And of course they wouldn't be not talking about it if it were Catholic malfeasance, if it were Protestant uh, bigotry or something like that, they would be talking about it. But Islam is given a break. Why? Because of an elite idea that somehow Islam is somewhere on the intersectional chain of oppression that other that Christian religions aren't because Christian Christianity is the national religion. It's the country's religion. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing idea. It's an amazingly bad idea. It's an amazingly bad idea for intelligent people to talk about. I, you know, I, I've known, I, I've hung out with extremely intelligent, very well-educated people all my life. Okay. I was, I was mingled in with them at Berkeley. I I knew a lot of the professors there. I talked to the professors and I'm here to tell you that they're no better or worse than any other people, but that you can be incredibly well-educated and incredibly intelligent and an absolute dope. 
It is amazing. It is amazing. I mean, when I say a dope, I mean a guy who does not, if he walks into a corner, it takes three people and a compass to get him to walk out. I mean, the kind of dope that you usually associate with guys who talk like Goofy from the cartoons. You go, God, talk like that. And you think, that's the stupid guy. But no, it no, stupidity, foolishness, incredible blindness to the facts exists at every level of intellection and every level of IQ. This is why these guys who get obsessed about IQ, which is kind of a secret racist code at this point, guys who get obsessed about IQ, I don't give them the time of day. I do not give them the time of day. I, I am telling you, I have talked to housewives who obviously are not that well educated, who are not, who are, and maybe even not that, don't have that high IQs, who have wisdom, who have intelligence, who see the world as it is, who walk through the world with, with a level of joy that I connect with spirituality. And I have talked to college professors who are dumb as bricks. And so I, when I see this, you know, you know, when I see this, an act of what may well be terrorism, but is certainly associated with a religion that has been associated with terrorism all over the world, that has been in part of every major conflict since the Vietnam War, except for the Mexican drug war that is involved in every major conflict going on right now. That is, as one writer once said, I think it was Samuel Harrington said, it's bloody at its borders, wherever it meets with anybody else. And bloody within its own borders. It's bloody, you know, is Muslim against Muslim. And this is not to say, and I know people say, oh, he's an Islamophobic, whatever that means. It is not to say Muslim people are bad. It is to say that there are ideas in the Islamic world that are fomenting, that seem to be fomenting violence and terror, and they should be talked about. They don't go away. Just like cancer, they don't go away if you ignore them. And that is no, that's another, it's another failure of our elites to say, hey, you know, we're here to talk about ideas. That's what elites are for. That's what they do. Instead, they've created a culture of fear and silence. And it has ramifications on both the left and the right that are bad. I'll talk about that uh, in just a second. But first, let me remind you that, uh, as I said, another kingdom comes out for everybody. But if you want to get it early, you want to become a subscriber. And you, you can become all levels of subscriber at this point. For as little as 10 bucks a month, you get our articles ad-free. You get access to all of our live broadcasts. You get our full show library. You can select bonus content. You get our exclusive Daily Wire app, which is really good. And then you can choose the new all-access plan, and you get all of that. Plus, <laughs> my, I, I mean, come on. You get the legendary Leftist Tears Tumblr forged on uh, Mount T Leftist Tears or whatever, uh, hammered out by dwarves, uh, actual magical dwarves, and then rolled into the shape on the thighs of virgins. It's our <laughs> Leftist Tears Tumblr. It is like nothing else on earth except other tumblers that don't say Leftist Tears on them. And you also get our brand new Ask Me Anything style discussion feature that allows you to engage our hosts, writers, and special guests on a weekly basis. You've been talking to me on that. You've talked to Knowles, but I'm sure there have also been interesting ones. Uh, so come on over to dailywire.com and subscribe at whatever level you can afford and whatever level you think will support us to the level that we're accustomed uh, so that we can buy nice things. Come on over. So Tucker Carlson had a guy on his show named Pete DeBrusca, who was running for Congress North Carolina, South Carolina, I can't remember. And Tucker set this guy up. I mean, he, he teed him up and basically let him uh, go off. And one of the people he went off on was us, the Daily Wire. And, well, let's listen to what he said. Those are the old party rules, Tucker. And I think that there's a new Republican Party in town. It's people like myself who are, you know, younger and uh, less controlled by, should we say, the conservative ink crowd or maybe the uh, the donor class in Washington, D.C., and the political elites. We understand the game. We understand that the Chamber of Commerce has bought and paid for our Congress people, and we understand that it has bought and paid for organizations like Turning Point USA. Uh, we understand it has bought and paid for media outlets uh, like the Daily Wire, for example, who are not meaningfully conservative in any way, who can never be trusted to conserve anything. So this guy is a full-blown groper. Uh, he's one of these alt-right guys with an underpinning of white nationalism, uh, of bigotry, of bigotry. The idea that this is a white civilization, what he's on there with, Tucker believes in much less immigration, both legal and illegal, which, by the way, th I'm fine with. That's, an, that's another open debate. That's fine. And this, is, this guy is uh, 
asking for an immigration moratorium so that no more people are coming in than are leaving. And they talked about this like it was some forbidden idea, that it was a it, it racist at its heart, uh, and therefore it was something kind of wicked and cool they were talking about. And again, Tucker just let him go off on that. And one of the things that really I really disrespect about the Groypers are these little phrases they come up with that they never have to explain. They never have to explain the meaning of what does it mean, conservative ink, that with the, the Daily Wire is a successful conservative outlet. Chamber of Commerce conservatism is an idea, by the way, I have some connection to because I read the Wall Street Journal and the Wall Street Journal is very pro illegal immigration. They don't have any problem with illegal immigration because it serves business. They get cheaper workers and they come in and they're constantly making excuses for it as if the only consideration were economic. But the only consideration is not economic. There's a social consideration and there's the most important consideration to me, which is if you don't respect the rule of law, no law will be safe. So in other words, there is such a thing as a chamber of commerce uh, conservative. The Wall Street Journal, how is that us? We've all been we've all been outspoken about immigration, especially illegal immigration, that it should be kept back. But what they're really talking about is race. And for Tucker to let this guy go, you know, I I like Tucker. I like his show. I think he says things that are really interesting and different. But this guy is a racist and this guy is a follower of Nick Fuentes, who is a racist. You know, Nick Fuentes, Nick Fuentes has come out. Uh, and said that he's against interracial marriage. And and the thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about the way that elites on the right give these guys fodder. Because people keep saying to me, I'm demonizing the Groypers. I'm demonizing them because they're bad. They're bad people who believe bad things, okay? And the, the, thing, the thing is, they're given credence by things that elites say on the right that aren't true, okay? When elites say, for instance, oh, the left writes the rules of engagement. When they say the left writes the rules of engagement, that we have to obey those rules. We can't say anything about race because they'll call us racist. We'll lose our sponsors. When we do that, when we bow, kowtow to the left's crappy rules that are meant intentionally to silence us, then we give credence to the Groypers because we make them look brave. We make them look brave. When they say racist things, we make them look brave instead of what they are, which is hateful. Okay, And when they say uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce conservatives, it's true. The Wall Street Journal should reconsider. They should reconsider that there are other things besides money. Money isn't everything. But listen to Nick Fuentes. I, I, I hate to play the guy because I just find him uh, disreputable. But, but listen to him talk about interracial marriage, for instance. I, uh, I think interracial relationships, I would never be in one. I wouldn't want my children to be in one. I just think it's no good. I, it's against my values. And uh, in the context of that comment, I was saying the subject was more about what the media was doing. You know, if you watch the debate, the actual context of it was, why should I watch like a Kia commercial and be propagandized about interracial relationships? Like, I feel like even if you approve of that kind of thing, even if you like that, uh, I feel like still social engineering by advertisers is probably wrong, probably not where we want to be as a society. You know, it's like I want to buy uh, McDonald's or I want to buy a Whopper without having to be told like, hey, wh subliminally, what do you think about, you know, being in a relationship with somebody of a different race? I think it's inappropriate. But then that issue aside, yeah, I'm just totally against it. And I don't know why that's a bad thing. I It's not like I don't tolerate people. I know a lot of people in interracial relationships who are good friends of mine, but it's just not something I would have for myself. I want to marry my own people. So now every time he talks about this, he says, I don't know why it's a bad thing, but he never says why it's a good thing. He never says why it's a good thing to if two people are in love with one another. Uh, and, and obviously Nick Fuentes is, is the product of a biracial marriage. He, he doesn't say if two people are in love with one another, uh, why they should be kept apart by the color of their skin. He says, I want my grandchildren to look like me. Well, tough nuts, you know, <laughs> it's like, so what? So what would you want your grandchildren to be? You don't get to choose with your grand. You, you only get to choose to love them. That's all you get with your grandchildren. Children. That's a gift. That's a gift. And if you can't do that because they don't look like you, shame on you. Shame on you. That's that's a, an, an inhuman thing. So he but what he plays on, if you listen to him carefully, what they all do is what they play on is the flaws of the elites. He says that every ad shows an interracial couple. I've noticed that, too. I, I think, like, are there that many interracial couples or are they selling us something with our burgers? Right. In other words, I, I I hardly notice when there are interracial couples because I, every place I've ever lived, there have been many interracial cu couples. 
But when I see ad after ad after ad and there's never you know, a non-interracial couple, I do start to think, ah, like, hey, you're propagandizing me. Stop it. And that gives credence to this clown who's a racist. And I think that, you know, it, it's just so uh, important that the elites on our side, on, at least on our side, speak with measured truthfulness, that we speak with measured truthfulness, that we talk about the fact that, yeah, you know, bringing in a, a million Somali Muslims and dumping them in a town in the Midwest is culturally bad. It's not bad because of the color of the skin. It's bad because of their culture and because there's no system for assimilating that many people that quickly. And that we do have a culture. We do have beliefs, a belief system. And in order for people to join it, they have to want to join it. They have to love it. And they have to be assimilated once they get here. And you can only do that to a certain number of people at a time. That's always the reason why people have started to get antsy about uh, immigration at a certain point. If we don't speak truth fearlessly, if we don't speak truth fearlessly, these guys ha- get credence. Now, there aren't that many of them. I'm not afraid of them. But, but Tucker knows better. Tucker knows better. Michelle Malkin knows better. They're just both so angry, I think, and so tired of being told to be silent that it gives a sort of glamour to these people. But but guys like like Tucker Carlson, a guy as smart as Tucker Carlson, a, a woman as smart as Michelle Malkin, they know better than to promote people who are essentially racist, who essentially dislike people for the color of their skin. When every time Nick Fuentes says, I don't see what's so wrong with opposing interracial marriage, my answer is, what's right about it? Name one thing that's right about it, except you want to control the, col- the skin color of your grandchildren. And name one thing that's good about it. And they keep talking about Christianity. They keep talking about Christian culture because they're anti-Semitic on top of it. Show me, show me the, the line in the gospel that permits you to hate the image of God because it looks a little different than you, because its skin color is a little different than yours. You show me that line, and then you can talk to me about Christianity. Until then, until then, you're the enemy of those thoughts. You're the enemy of the basic ideas that made uh, the Western civilization so great. The the multi-ethnicity that has made Western civilization great since Rome, and certainly that has made Christianity great, and certainly has made America great. And this is the, the, the problem, the failure of elites the failure of elites lets bad ideas rise, and our elites have utterly failed. And this impeachment thing that's going on is part of that failure, and so is the silence about Islamist terrorism, and, and it just allows bad ideas to rise. Let me end with a final, a little, a slightly happier final reflection, because I, I'm really uh, deep into thinking about Advent right now. It, it is, for me, a uh, very um, joyous uh, celebration, the uh, coming of Christmas, which uh, really reminds us of the coming of Christ. And I was thinking, uh, reading about uh, the the Virgin Mary, and I'm not a big, you know, I'm not a b- big into the Catholic veneration of the Virgin Mary, that uh, idea that elevates her almost to the level of Christ himself. But of course, she is this uh, titanic, this majestic uh, figure in the midst of the Christian story. And it occurs to me that her, that her feminine role her feminine role is a role model for all people, male and female, uh, in th- their approach to God. And this is one of the reasons, one of the many thousands of reasons why I hate feminism is because in its insistence that men not be men, it makes it difficult for men to even think about, because they're under attack, because they want to defend themselves, it makes it difficult for men to even think about the fact that when you start to think about feminine and masculine principles, you're no longer thinking about people. When you start to think about feminine and masculine principles instead of people, that there is a way in which all people are in the feminine role when it comes to God. And that's why Jesus refers to God as the bridegroom is coming, which makes Israel, that makes the people the bride, right? And that's why they were, That's why God, you know, the feminists are always saying, well, why is God a man? Why is God a man? God is a man because all of us have a feminine role. And what is that role? That's the role that the Virgin Mary plays, which is she stops and she says yes to being filled with God. And then having been filled with God, allowing a space inside herself for God to grow, right? And obviously, that's a truth. It's a physical truth, but it's also a metaphor. And it's something that all of us have to do to stop, to say yes, to be quiet and still and allow God to grow inside us so that he can then come forth into the world through us. And so every one of us is uh, is in a position with God, is in the position with God of the Virgin Mary. Every single one of us is in that position of saying yes 
being still, allowing God to to fill us and grow within us and then come forth into the world. And it really is a beautiful thing when you stop and think about it, that this yin-yang principle that is exemplified by men and women, it's, it is incarnated in men and women, yet it, it exists in the very fabric of reality and certainly within the fabric of God, which is why when it says in the Bible that God made man in his image, it says he made male and female in his image, because both are in his image and both roles uh, have, uh, both uh, sexes have something to tell us about ourselves and our relationship to reality. I just wanted to get that out because I wanted to talk about something more pleasant than our corrupt elites, but I will be back tomorrow to talk about more unpleasant stuff (laughs) if I can find it. I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Austin Stevens and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. And our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saevitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. And our production assistant is Nick Sheehan. The Andrew Clavin Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. On the Matt Wall Show, we're not just discussing politics. We're talking culture, faith, family, all of the things that are really important to you. So come join the conversation.